So welcome to the Coaches Coffee Club. Um, myself and, and, and Jamie Godbold are absolutely delighted to, to welcome Ross Embleton to, to, to the Coaches Coffee Club this week. Um, and we're going to be talking everything coaching. Uh, looking back on Ross's career, how did he get into coaching? Uh, what makes a good coach in terms of characteristics and, co and qualities? Um, and then into sort of what has shaped him and moulded him and, ha and how has he become the coach he is today? Um, and then off the back of it, um, this will be recorded, obviously, and uploaded to my mentor platform uh, that you can download, enjoy. And there's a resource that uh, Ross has produced in terms of sessions uh, for you guys to enjoy uh, and to replicate with your uh, with your team and in your environment. Um, so without any more uh, talking for myself, I will hand you over to Ross just to introduce himself a little bit and then we'll get down into the Q&A. Um, that a few of you have sent on and we really appreciate those questions as well over to you Ross yeah firstly thanks for having me um, and hopefully it's um, the, the conversations and the questions and, and what we discuss turns to, turns out to be of benefit to people um, there's a, there's a, I'm passionate first and foremost about football and coaching like so many of us uh, but I think that uh, one thing that, that I'm holding real high regard for, for myself and, and the coaching that I do is I like to really try to stretch myself across many different um, levels, formats of the game. And that's working with real young children. Uh, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about elements of my career, but um, in, in a number of different ways to really try to stretch myself and working with those young kids all the way through to the... Um, the experiences that I've had of, of working with, with first team players. And one of the things that really try to pride myself on is to try to find all the um, elements of, of the game that, that relate to, to each age group and each level, how they can transfer and, and eat into each other and how I can benefit as a coach and, and get the most out of the players that I work with, whoever it might be, by, by using all of those different experiences. So... Hopefully that comes out in the conversation that we're that we're having today, um, and, uh, and and everybody sees it as as a, as, as a benefit um, with regards to what we're discussing, and and hopefully that they can take it into their own coaching. I'm 100% sure they will, and I know we've had rather um, you know relevant is that we often have a costa ourselves and have a catch up most mornings in the week. Um, so I'm 100% I'm sure the audience uh, will, will, will learn an awful lot from this. Um, I guess for the first sort of question, um, and to give some sort of background, is, is how did you become a coach? Um, I was really lucky, if, if I'm honest, um, that when I was a young player, like, like most people I'm sure that, that are listening in now, um, had the same dreams as everybody else of, of becoming a professional footballer in some way, shape or form, but at the age of 15, stroke 16, sort of leaving, leaving school years back then, uh, I, I, was, I was a young player at Leighton Orient and I was, I was told that I wasn't going to be good enough, which um, is obviously heartbreaking at the time. But looking back now was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because um, I stopped fighting the fight pretty soon after that of, of wanting to try to, to, to play football. Um, and stopped playing quite young. But what it meant was at the age of sort of 15, 16, I went straight into coaching. Um, I say, I use the words coaching, but it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't that by any stretch of the imagination to begin with. It was about picking kids up and tying shoelaces and <laughs> getting bums on seats and making sure that they came back every Saturday morning. Um, so I don't want to try and glamorise it or make it sound as if there was this um, art to what I was doing but I think the biggest thing that that taught me and really stood me in good stead was it was about providing sessions or an environment or uh, an opportunity for people to come kids to come and play football and enjoy playing football and to come back the week later that was probably the the, the one or the, one of the number of things that that, that really drove on the sessions that, that I was doing and um, as I say, sort of put an end to my football playing career, but but at the time it was a real blessing because it, it made me focused on on what's turned out to be or make up certainly the most of my career so far. So um, I think to add to that, another sort of really fortunate position that I found myself in was my dad had always been a coach part time, 
grassroots um, as, a, as, a, as an academy coach at Leighton Orient as well, or Centre of Excellence coach as it was back then. So I had a real opportunity to be around um, someone or a number of people that could influence me and try to help me along the way and try to you know, see what the, the basics were about at, at that stage. Um, but like I say, very, very early on, still at school, probably a lot of my mates going to work in shoe shops and sweet shops and Sainsbury's, and I earned my money by Saturday morning, kick about football sessions and working as a, I suppose, a, a support or a helper type coach during during half term soccer camps really um just on on that ross um that you mentioned about starting starting at the bottom or, or, or starting with the, the the real young age groups um what what sort of characteristics or skills that um does does that need that you possibly might still that still sort of them sort of values that, that you work with with the young age groups do you still hold dear sort of today? I think the one major thing is personality and I think what that means is not necessarily whether you like me or you think I've got one as we sit and have a costa as Jane mentioned or James mentioned or we have a pint on a Saturday night I, I think it's personality in terms of the way that you can interact with people of different backgrounds, different experiences, different levels of quality, um, different levels of interest, as it would have been with those young kids at the time. But I think that is the main thing before anything else is what needs to be transferable from the three-year-old that comes on a Saturday morning or to the 39-year-old that's still playing mm -hmm. professional football. I think if you've got a personality and you can hook people and you can... Um, communicate with people even if it's people that don't like you even if it's people that don't always totally um, believe or fit into systems formations into teams it's about having the that personality to be able to to bring people in to find a common goal to work towards mm. um, common goal sounds a bit drastic when I refer to the three four five year olds but it's about having the personality that they wanted to come back a week later and, and, and carry on playing football. It's about working on a housing estate and the boys and girls and kids that are in a in an environment where um, you're provide, trying to provide a, a kickabout football that they want to come and be part of that session and they're excited and energised about being part of it. And then the same thing when you're having that day-to-day -day work with an under-18 with a first-team player that you can energise people and make them want to want to enjoy coming to work, which is, I know, I know I can speak with experience, but when you go to work, you're, you're a hell of a lot happier in, your, in, your, in life, but at the same time, I think you perform that a little bit better. Good. And then, I guess, given your sort of motivations then were primarily uh, a little bit around bums on seats to continue earning that money at that such a young age, uh, and being a coach at a young age like that, it's obviously... Um, potentially quite unheard of, really. Um, what what's been the motivations? Uh, what what was the, I guess the the, the way that you then went? Actually, I, I quite like this. What what made you say, yeah, I want to be a coach. This is this is for me. And then, what are your motivations, sort of, as a coach now compared to then? I think then it was about um, there was not there was never a plan. I think that's the easiest way that I can describe it is that. I never ever sat back at 17, 18, 19 and thought, right, do you know what? One day I'm going to be England manager. I, I never had that image in my mind of becoming a, uh, an academy coach or a first, like first team coach, first team, whatever, you know, whatever direction many young coaches aspire to be in. That. I don't think there's anything wrong with it and I would never shoot anybody down for having a plan and a direction. Um, but for me, it wasn't like that. It was about, I really enjoy this. Um, I'm passionate about it. I want to get better. And I think I've got a chance of doing okay and making this my living, um, making this the, the type of job and environment that I want to be in every day. And, the, and whatever role or job that I'm in, I want to be really good at it. Um, I think it's easy to sit here and say, I want to be the best. But I think there's so many people out there that would have that drive. But I think it's about trying to be the best that you can be 
in the environment that you're in. So each time, like I say, I, I regard myself as very fortunate in terms of how my career developed and, and, and has worked out because, you know, there'd be people that would claim I've right place, right time, or, you know, whatever the cliches might be. But it was about whatever role I went into, right, this one, I'm going to try and be really good at it. Some of them I wasn't. Some of them I was useless. And I'm sure we, we, we'll touch on some of them ones that I was useless from. But I can look back on those and thought, you know what, I tried really hard. I wanted to aspire to be really good at it. How did I come out of it at the end of that or, you know, when, when things changed? What did I learn to make myself that little bit better each time? And like I say, it was never really with a, with a majorly end goal. It would almost be, right, I've cracked on with this for a little while. I've had two, three, four, five years at, at doing something in particular. Now what direction am I going to go in and how can I get better at it? Um, I was given some advice once, to come on to the, because you did ask me a question about like, how that refers to now, but I was given some advice when I, when I first started coaching uh, by Chris Ramsey, who's at QPR now. And Chris Ramsey always said to me, um, as a young coach, until you, that day when you're sitting in the hot seat and you're telling everybody what to do, you do what you're told and you do it to the very best of your ability. And I actually think as much as that can be a little bit demoralising for some people, it actually made my life a hell of a lot easier each time I went into a new position because I think, right, what do these people want? Right, this is the philosophy or this is the direction, this is, the, this is what the academy or the club wants at that particular time. Right, so that's what I've got to go and deliver. And it actually made me a hell of a lot more flexible and a hell of a lot more of a capable coach because rather than just going in and going, no, this is what I do as a coach, this is what I want to see from my players, my team, my sessions, it was, no, what have I got to deliver for other people? And it really made my life easier, but like I say, made me a hell of a lot more flexible. And I think as I've, as, as I've got to the last number of years working around a first-team environment, I think that was one thing that made me really um, feel as though I could develop and, and kick on in, in, in that area of the game, is that when I worked for people, if they wanted to play a certain way, I felt comfortable that I could go and find out or adapt what I do and what I'm good at in order to fit with, with different philosophies or ideas. Um, you, you touched on the, the variety of different roles. Could you, can you give us a flavour of, some of them, um, some of the clubs that you work with, maybe some of the different philosophies that they had, but um, I guess sort of touching on how adaptable that you've had to be just just with the with the variety of roles that, that you've had in your career. Yeah, I, my, my career started at Leighton Orient, as I said, I, I got released as a young player and I was really fortunate that a lot of the coaches and people around the football in the community at the time and, and and people that were involved in the in the, the centre of excellence were they, you know, took, they like they liked me or they found see that there was a little bit of potential for me to work within there. So a lot of my early stages in my career was spent um, after school clubs, half term camps, housing estates, coaching a real variety of kids, a real variety of environments, and it gave me a real opportunity to learn a lot about different people and how you, you know how you motivate those people. Um, so a big part of the first, I would say, the, my first six, seven years was all about football in the community. And that was some grassroots teams, as I say, there, the school programmes, half-term activities. And, and each, I suppose, time I progressed, I got more responsibility. So I started to run those camps and deal with parents and um, mm. not always just about what I was doing as a coach and putting cones down. It was about you know, management and the business side of, of, of that. So that, that, was, that was a real positive part of my, of my development. Um, I was very fortunate that I got to the age of 25, 26, and the club, the football club itself, was, was uh, in a bit of an uncertain position. There'd been some changes in staff, and I took on the role as head of youth development at 25 um, for like a five-month period until the end of the season before the club decided what they wanted to do. So it was an incredible opportunity for me to have a right go at something for five months, not really knowing where it was going to go. But during that time, I, I, I feel I'd done the job well enough to get offered the job on a permanent basis. So I then managed the club's youth development programme for three seasons. Um, and then I left Orient. I've been there forever. Uh, the season ticket older. You know, joined the club as a player when I was 11. And I, and I left at 28, 29 to go to Tottenham. 
I went there and I did an academy role, which was joint with the club's foundation, where I worked as a with like coach development for the foundation. And we were trying to create a pathway for coaches as well as young players. You know, we have the development centres and that sort of structure that fit into academy football now. The club were trying to put a pathway in place for its coaches to go into that academy pathway as well as you know, what the kids were doing as well. And I also oversaw the, the, the foundation phase that it is now, the 7 to 12 uh, year old bracket at Tottenham. I did that for three years, but I started to find that I wasn't coaching as much as I liked. And an opportunity came up for me to go to Bournemouth. So I went to AFC Bournemouth and saw the early stages of that rise from League One to the Premier League, which was which was incredible. So I had a season coaching the under 18s, which was fantastic for my coaching. It got me back out on the grass every day, working with good players, working in an environment I never had before. So I worked, went from working with the rough, tough inner city kids you know, kids from, from London with a bit of an edge to go into nice Bournemouth, which where it was leafy. And I had to find a new way of motivating new people. So that was a massive part of my, yeah. my education. Um, probably the first time as well where the philosophy changed a little bit. So going into Bournemouth, a lot of it was about pass, 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 dominating the ball, having possession of the ball as a team, rather than being solely focused on individuals. Whereas my previous experiences at working at Tottenham and a lot of the work that we've done at Orient was about developing the individual, about uh, players playing with high intensity, energy, you know, uh, a lot of the, especially with the younger age groups, players working on their in individual techniques and having very much a philosophy focus on the individual. Whereas at Bournemouth, it was a lot more about the team and, and the group. Um, so again, variation and, and being out there every day working with the under 18s was something I've, I've never done before um, after I left Bournemouth I went to Norwich and, and that would be my first reference about not being very good um, I went to Norwich in a, in, a, in a recruitment capacity and I struggled really badly because I didn't really know how to watch the game as a recruitment officer I used to go to games all over the South East watching Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, grassroots football and I'd sit there thinking why are they not playing out from the back why does he pass that one down the line, why is the striker not make this sort of and I was analysing the game and on what I wanted to see rather than watching the individuals and I really struggled I really struggled and, and, and I found it really tough to, to become a, 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 a recruitment officer or a, a you know, head of recruitment I found that really difficult at the time and learned a hell of a lot about myself worked standalone rather than part of being in a training ground or at a club every day um, but like I say, personally, learned a hell of a lot about, about that. But I lost that job probably fortunately in the end, but Norwich got not relegated and I got made redundant. So um, I then did some, some work back at Tottenham, um, out in America and China on some of their international programmes um, before going back into a professional football club environment and my first experience of working um, with a first team when I was, that was when I became first team coach at Swindon. Um, so I had just under two years at Swindon and then I went on to Leighton Orient where I was assistant coach, interim head coach and then uh, unfortunately after the passing of Justin Edinburgh I became head coach. Wow, uh, amazing. Um, I, I was just thinking as you, and probably more of a personal question, and, you know when you sort of um, like uh, someone gets sacked or, or a, a job gets offered your way and it's like, did you ever doubt yourself? Did you ever go, am I, am I ready for this? Or, do you know, is this too much for me? And, or is, do you go going, yeah, that's like, I'm going to, I'm going to fly with this. Is it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, very much so. I think um, I left the Orient job to go to Tottenham and, and, I, and I, I, I went there confident in what I'd, done what I was going to do but I was really open-minded because I thought right I'm going to work with Alex Inglethorpe you know as good as there is in youth development Chris Ramsey you know on the same level John McDermott goes without saying what what John's capabilities were Perry Sutton you know up there with, with the best goalkeeper coaches and I, and I thought this is going to be an incredible environment for me to go into so I was confident in the area that I was going to work and coach but I wasn't so confident of sitting in the room with these elite experts, if you like, 
um, because they were the people I was going there to learn from. But at the same time, I, you know, I, I was going in there full time, and you have, I, I suppose, had to puff my chest out and show show that I had a, a confident exterior where there was that element of doubt. Um, I think when it came to going to Bournemouth, I really felt that I'd learned a hell of a lot about what my coaching was like, what my personality was like. That I went in there and I was really had real belief in what I was going to do. I mean, a real doubt came. And I didn't learn this until I walked into probably about two weeks into to being at Swindon. And I I did a session with the players that were out the squad. So we were getting rid of getting rid getting ready for a game at the weekend. And the assistant and the manager were taking the eleven v eleven or you know, whatever the structure was for the day. And I took the players that weren't going to be involved at the weekend. And they did not put an ounce of effort in. And there were some real difficult characters in the group. We were struggling at the time. And I remember coming away thinking, what on earth have I done? <laughs> I've, I'm, I was living away from my family. And for the first time ever, I thought, well, what? I've just put on a session. And it was the biggest car crash ever because they, they didn't want to know. And I remember going back in for lunch after training and manager and assistant going to me, how was that, mate? And I was like, how was that? If you have <laughs> watched it, you'd never have me take a session with these players ever again. <clears throat> and they both were obviously a lot more experienced than I was at that level. And both we sat down and had a chat about, really, it weren't about the football. It weren't about me putting on a session that was any good and going to make them any better or something that they were going to they were gonna take to. It was about managing them as people. And I really then, all the things that we've discussed so far about personality, etc. that was the first time then I thought, oh, wow, even at first team level, I've got to come in here and get these lads on my side or, you know, ready to listen to what I'm going to say. Again, whether they like me or not, whether they really believe in what I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying, I've got to come here and try and get them on side in some way, shape or form. And it, it made me really approach the whole thing a lot differently. And I, I simplified a lot of what I was trying to do. I realised that they probably didn't really want loads and loads of coaching. They wanted to go out and have a run around and do something that was going to excite them and energise them because they weren't going to be involved in the team at the weekend. So slowly I started to, to develop relationships with them and try to break down that, that barrier. And um, yeah, over, over, over a period of time, I then found my way in, but certainly in those first that first week or two, I was I was blown away with the fact that I, I, I thought I was going into this League One football club, and I was now a League One first team coach. And actually, the coaching was irrelevant. Just, um, <coughs> I'm just going to turn on the light. Uh, we can edit this two seconds. No worries, mate. <laughs> That's probably made about a minuscule bit of difference until it warms up a little bit. Um, so you've obviously touched a little bit on your background and, and sort of the challenges or, or potential setbacks uh, that you've had. Um, how have you, how did you learn from them? What was your process for learning as much as because we are an education development platform? Um, what what what's your process if something does go right at the weekend or or in life in general? What what does Ross Hambleton do to recenter, refocus, and come back sort of fighting again? I think um, like the courses now and, and the FA teacher and talk talk a hell of a lot about reviewing, and I I think there's a lot of time and energy spent talking about when you do it, how you do it. I I think it's about that constant analysis of, of what you do and how you do it and I think of course the first thing when you hear the word analysis is oh, did you watch the game back, did you watch your session back if you've got the luxury to, to do so but for me it's about thinking about it, it's about spending the time in the, it might be in the car driving home from the session, it might be um, talking to, to, to your players about the session I think that's something that not not enough people that I speak to. I'm not saying not enough people do it, because, I, but not enough people that I I communicate with consult their players in the good and the bad about a session. Consult their players about what we do in the session. 
talk to the players and the and the staff or people that you work with that can influence the session in order to help you get better. Um, so I think it's not always about reviewing what was good and what was bad. It's what the what the motivation was like before, what what your communication was like. All the things that of course people present to us that that are going to help you help you review. But I think it's that that constant consultation with people in order to try to get as many different opinions and ideas and opportunities of of, of feedback in order to try to help you get better. And I, like I say, I would refer back to one of the first points that I make. It, for me, it's always been about getting better, about being good, about proving people wrong or um, trying to put things right, trying to do the very best I can for the players that I'm working with at that particular time. Um, so I think that's something that I'm quite deep, deep on. Um, and then I think it's, again, then how you implement that feedback or that analysis into what you're going to do again, which I know sounds, <coughs> excuse me, sounds quite fairly obvious, but it is about a reaction to, to something, about rea a reaction to something good or something not so good, a reaction to, to, to putting things right or correcting the wrongs. That, that's really, really important. And not that you just write it down, think about it, discuss it, but you actually go and try and recreate it or go and try and um, put it into practice uh, and, and not be scared to go and make mistakes and, and, and do things wrong. I think that's a that's a, a huge part of it for me is, is, is showing people that you're willing to be creative and try things is, um, is something that I think is immensely important. And I, and I would like to think that, that certainly now or, or in my previous job that that was something that i really prided prided myself i don't know if that's the right word but I, I took immense pride in trying to do was that i always wanted my sessions to be fresh i realized that players don't actually really remember many of your sessions in terms of where that cone was and what how many bibs you used and what type of runs you asked them to make a lot of the time what they remember is what you what you give them but i really always push myself to try to make sure that my sessions evolve and 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 they and they and, and I'm re ready and willing to sort of put my neck on the line to 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 show that I'm ready to to change and be creative in what I'm trying to deliver. Um great stuff. You you mentioned quite a quite a few times just around your own personal drive to be to wanting to be the best you can be and and, and that that constant improvement. Uh, can you share any examples of the stuff that you've done, I don't know, books you've read? How, where have you gone to, to seek that improvement? I think one of my first ones, and I have to refer to this because I haven't done so far, is one of my biggest motivations in order to, to improve and get better and be as good as I can be at what I do is because of my lack of playing background. I felt that as a young coach, it was something that was always rammed down my throat that I had a ceiling that I was going to be able to do this, but not quite go beyond that because I hadn't played. And I think certainly the world and football has, has or it seems to be evolving to a degree around that snobbery of whether you've been a footballer, whether you're not. In my opinion was always, it's a completely different career. Um, so that was always a massive part of my motivation. And I have to include that because I, I'm quite proud of the fact that I had, I haven't had a playing background and I've, and I've had a number of the jobs that I have done. But I think um, my, it was about, for me, being open-minded. I think we're in now, right now, we are in the best place possible in terms of resource and opportunity to, to pick up new ideas and learn. I mean, you, we, we, we pretty much have got a click of a button to be able to watch at least a few sessions of the best coaches in the world. So it can't get much, much better than that. But when I look back, for me, it was about... Um, reading as much as I possibly could on the people that, that, that motivated me. So I was really uh, driven to, to, to read books by Alex Ferguson and Mourinho and Pochettino, I suppose, coming a little bit closer to the times now. That's without touching on Pep because we'll, we'll get to him in a minute. But um, it was about trying to take the best ideas and aspire to be the best at that time. And what I mean by that is um, if we were working with young players at AFC Bournemouth, 
it was about trying to drive and find out what the top players are doing, what the best people are doing in the world in order to try to have direction for those players to try and at least aspire to mimic it or achieve it or go somewhere close to pretending we're going to get somewhere on that level to try and do the things that the very, very top people are doing, both myself, but for the players that you're trying to, to drive on. So for me, it's at each time it's been about trying to aspire to, to achieve what the best ones are doing. So I say like right now, it'd be about looking at what clock, what two call, what, uh, what, what Pep are doing in order to try to, to at least mimic that with young players, with your team, with, team that okay might not be quite capable of, of achieving that but being able to to, to head in that sort of direction because I think if you're not aspiring to be the best you're never ever actually going to achieve it you're never actually going to get there because we're too willing to cut ourselves short um, but coming away from from some of that I think the other parts of it as well is about trying to take from the very very best outside of football as well so listen to a number of podcasts and been fortunate enough to be on a webinar with Eddie Jones um, real lover still and I would read it again of Clive Woodward's book um, when you look uh, it's black box thinking in it with the um, with the all blacks is that right yes yeah, right isn't it um, so for me it's about trying to aspire to be listen to the very very best both in football and away from it as well, so that you're not missing out on any opportunities. Because so many of them different things, even if it's not tactically or technically, there's so many different aspects of, of those team sports that relate to to what we're trying to do in football, and vice versa. Um, you, you mentioned, um, sorry, James, you were going to oh, say. I, I was just looking for a tweet because it read uh, uh, it came up on my um, timeline this morning. Uh, and it's Andreas Georgeson. Uh, and he says, uh, when you don't have any playing background and come into coaching, you just have to work four times as hard to get the opportunities. How, how is that something you can relate to? Yeah, without doubt. Um, and to be honest, in, in terms of where I'm at right now, it's something that's very, very um, difficult in terms of the time and what you commit to, 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 to having a, a career in this game, because it's, you got to prove yourself. You can't, um, you can't just walk in the door and, and, and have credibility or people looking at you as if you have got credibility just because you've played football. And I can, I can say that from experience that I've seen people that have achieved the very, very most in, in, in professional football that cannot communicate with people or cannot relate to players or young players in a certain way. So, I've seen it the other way that, I, that you walk in and you quickly lose that respect. But I think what I was always, what always kept me going was that I felt like I was willing to work that little bit harder to put more hours in. I would go out and do my full-time job in, in a primary school, in an after-school club at half term on a Saturday morning. And then I would get in my car or on the bus and drive to, um, to watch an academy session and watch a good coach and, watch the first team train and of course you have days off but that motivation to be out learning from as many different people as you possibly can and then once you get the opportunities to take from them as much as possible in terms of going and, and delivering that good work that you see and I think that one of those major things and this isn't just a football thing in any way shape or form but it's not always about earning the money there and then it's about going out and giving up your time to go and do it because I touched upon the fact that we're in a great place for, for resource at the moment, but there's nothing better than standing on the side of a pitch and listening to a coach. There's nothing better than being in the middle of a session or behind the goal, listening to the, the snippets of information that the players are giving to each other or, or the, you know, a specialist is giving to someone, and being in, in that sort of context. And it doesn't matter if it's the very, very best, like I've just talked about, or a grassroots coach that's a parent you, you're always going to get opportunity to take from those people um obviously we've touched on some pretty high profile names um and a couple of questions that i have is the first one being role model who, who would you say is your role model or role models should i say because it could have well have evolved over the over the span of your career yeah um 
I, I was I would say that uh, my like my dad was a massive role model for me in terms of getting me into coaching, and throughout my career, the one major thing that my dad always advises me on because even though we both love football and we've both been involved in in coaching for a long long time, I never really sit down and talk to my dad about a four four two or a three at the back. A lot of the, what we discuss and the advice that he gave me when I was in my my previous role has been about managing people, about being you know how to communicate people or, or about being straight and being honest and one of the one of the real big things that you always told me was be honest with people in the job that you're in because even if they don't like it they'll have an element of respect for, for what they're hearing and it was about being trying to be as straight as i possibly could and to be honest probably took that too literally and i'm going to drop a massive name in here now but i was fortunate enough to go to everton early in the season spend some time with rafa benitez and he said to me one day um where did you think one of the things might have gone wrong for you in your previous job? And I said, I think there might have been times I tried to be too honest with people. And he went, yeah, yeah, don't always tell them everything. Don't tell them. And I remember thinking, why would you keep secrets from your players? But I understand where he's coming from, but a lot of that was, a lot of those, those qualities were, were things that my, you know, my dad's always taught me about working with people. And that, that comes out of football as well, of course. But um, I was very lucky that I had a, um, the, the head of football in the community at, at Leighton Orient and then when I went to work at Tottenham was it was a guy called Grant Cornwell and he he was really good with regards to um that 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 personality in your session um and about trying to relate to all your players and, and create an environment that they really liked coming into. So those are two names that that, that people would, would you know wouldn't wouldn't know. I think from a purely football perspective the people that I've learned a huge amount from is Luke Williams who, was, who I was at Swindon with uh, he was assistant manager when I first went there and then ended up as the manager uh, and we worked together for, for, for a good period of time he, his coaching and, and tactical work that he did with his players was outstanding um, and then the two other people that I think from a, again from a, from a football point of view was Chris Ramsey um, he's unbelievable qualities of being able to manipulate a session and plan sessions to suit all of the players or, or, or most of the players in his in, in a session was was as good as as, as I've ever seen um, and then Alex Inglefall Alex uh, is at Liverpool now but he was unbelievable communicator calm really really calm um probably the polar opposite to how I work in terms of the amount of energy I like to put across in my sessions. Alex was really, really calm and composed and considered in the way that he communicated and, and got his points across. And then just following on, because obviously a role model is, is something you can aspire to, uh, takes certain things from. Um, in terms of mentoring or being mentored, have you had a, an influence like that, either formally or informally? Well, and, and also, have you been, uh, given your experience, uh, have you been a mentor to anyone? Um, and sort of how do you go about that? Yeah, I think um, I would like, I, I would say that, that certainly Grant Cornwall, as I mentioned, there was a really good mentor for me. Harsh, very, very harsh. Um, to the point that when I first started coaching, I used to think, well, if he's going to be like this all the time. And what I mean by that is not, not shouting and screaming but would put me in environments where I was so far out my depth, it was unbelievable. Um, but like to give an example, because it's not about standing up in a coaching session, I turned up to a kid's presentation and we used to, I used to go with him and he used, to, he used to love to standing up on a stage, making people laugh, putting his point across, making the presentations, being the hero when you give out the Player of the Year award or Player of the Week award, whatever it might be. And I used to stand next to him, get, shake the kids' hands, give the trophies out. And one day I turned up and he made me stand on the stage without telling me and do the presentation. And I was so bad. It was, but do you know what? In all the environments ever since, I don't think I've ever stood somewhere and felt so uncomfortable. So at the time, even though I was arm in and er in, and, and I still have parents that I speak to now that were in that presentation 24 years ago, I still have every now and again, it comes up in conversation and one of the dads will text me and go, what about that time when you stood up on the stage and couldn't get your words out? But it taught me so much about being planned, being prepared. I never, ever went again with him anywhere 
without being planned and prepared and ready, just in case he threw me under the bus again and I needed to try to survive. Um, so that was just an example of many of the different environments that he used to throw me in. You know, I'd, I'd be sitting in the office and he'd say to me, right, we're off to an housing estate in Barking and you've got 20 lads, don't know how many you're going to have, don't know, uh, sorry, we've got a load of lads, don't know how many you're going to have, don't know what the facilities are going to be like, we'll see how many balls we've got when we get there, we better put on a session and see how we get on with it. And it was throwing me in the deep end, and at the time, even though I hated it, it was it was preparing me for for for, for anything in the future. And I, and I always remember sitting down one day with Justin Edinburgh and talking to him about my coaching and saying, "What can I do? What more do you, do you need from your from your assistant?" And he was saying to me, "I can't believe that you just one you can just walk outside and they right you've got five today or you've got twenty four today, and you can just think up sessions." But that's why I said about it all relating together. Is that over the over the years being placed in those situations and scenarios by someone like Grant that made made things very very um, a lot easier the further up the, the ladder if you like that I went and I feel I'm quite passionate now I wouldn't say that I, I necessarily throw out a name or, or or people that that I would I actually do mentor but I think that side of of coaching and working with people is something that I'm really passionate about doing I think it's something that I would like to develop further um, in terms of building those relationships and helping people on their way because it's as much about that with young coaches or aspiring coaches as it is with with players. It's a, it's a different motivation altogether. Um, but to be able to push someone and drive someone and hopefully maybe put a few of them in that uncomfortable environment that I was just talking about might be a nice feeling to watch someone else squirm through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just mentioned some some young um young inexperienced aspiring coaches um i'm going to be quite negative to start with what are some of the some of the things in common that that inexperienced or or or, uh, or not very good coaches what what do they do that stuff think, in common um, i think one, one of the important things that i should have probably said is it's not always about being young and inex- inexperienced a uh, number of the, the coaches that I work with in, in, in a local club to me now and, and whenever I've done any presentations, it, they're not necessarily kids who are wet behind the ears that you can influence. It's dads who are giving up their time and some of them in their 40s that have you know found their kids being interested in football and have found themselves in that. And, and it's about trying to find the motivation as to what they're, what they're trying to do. I think we have this thing, certainly when it comes to grassroots, that we all have a bit of negativity if someone shouts and screams and sometimes it's not necessarily them doing it to be nasty to the kids it's, it's sometimes out of over enthusiasm about being mm-hmm. passionate about trying to help and they just don't know how to manage themselves or their behaviors in order to try to achieve it properly um, but that would always be something that really gets my back up is when I watch people work with young players and they, and they don't have patience or they're you know they're not willing to give the kids a chance and, and, and make mistakes and learn from their errors because we all know how much how much benefit that can be to to young people and young players and people of, of lesser experience is that you've got to go through those hardships in order to achieve on the other side i think one thing that really really does grain on me from from coaches is the the desire to earn money from football before we've really mastered our skills and, and of course everyone wants to earn money everyone needs to earn money but I think there's a lot of people out there now that because of there's so much access and opportunity in this game that they want to climb the ladder before they've actually mastered how to get how to climb it and, and, and to put the hours in and build up their experiences and do things right and do things wrong. I think that's one thing that really um, frustrates me is, is, is someone gets their, their level one, their level two coaching badge and straight away, believes or, or thinks they've got the right to go out and earn money from from coaching football when actually there's, there's a little bit of disrespect behind that because of the amount of time that it takes to to really develop and be capable of, of standing in front of a group of players and giving them what they need in order to earn money and I think if you if you really have the drive to, to, to develop that that little bit follows on somewhere else along the line. Yeah, I, I I agree. Having having uh, tutored some of the courses, there was always a 
a rush. There was always a, before they'd even completed one, they were already wanting, asking questions when they could book onto the, onto the next one. Um, you know but what, I think, well, I think what you just said there is really important because you had so many times, especially when I was, was a head coach, the amount of times I used to get an email from someone or a message on a, you know, some sort of platform and they, they would start off by saying, I want to be a manager one day. And I'd, first of all, I'd say, don't, <laughs> please don't do it. But no, like, <coughs> I understand where they're coming from. I think it's fantastic that people have a drive and a direction that they want to get to. And I'd never want to shoot that down in someone because I didn't. It doesn't mean that it's, it was the right or the wrong attitude to have. But I think sometimes there can be that, this little lack of understanding of actually what it takes in order to get there, how tough it is in order to reach that and, and to just sort of, throw that out there willy-nilly and expect to be able to just get there like you say that you finish your course and, and you want to go on to the next one and you've got to do the work in order to be ready to go on to the next one otherwise you won't you won't learn and won't develop well enough from that course if you're not ready or, or anywhere near capable of of you know of, of being on it in the first place hmm. uh, we yeah we, we'd always sort of uh, debrief at the final day of the courses like we touch on what the next course is but there'd be a big but you know you've got to go now and just because you've passed or you've got the certificate that doesn't necessarily make you a good coach you, no. you've delivered well um, but that, you know better never stops is I think one thing that has come has been clear from from yourself um, is the sacrifices that that you've made to be better um and i'm not sure I, i'm not sure whether the coaches um understand the sacrifice that they might have to have to make to to want to you know climb the ladder and um like you said going out and watching people uh, volunteering um you know not expecting to get paid for it but just the experience that it that it's it gives you and yeah and the I different guess... ones as well jamie as well that's the other thing i think is really vital is the different experiences mm. of not just right i've passed my level two so i'm now going to go and work with under 13 14 it's about trying to you know master and find different ways of adapting yourself in order to work with different types of kids different age groups of kids kids with different motivations players with different motivations but whatever level it might be you might have a real niche that you want to you know you want to reach and you want to work with and of course and you put your all your efforts into into focusing and achieving on that but there's so many other things that can help you develop and get better that mm -hmm. that you need to take those things in, into consideration and also as well like we I touched upon the grassroots people and the, and the, the you know the the, the the coaches that that you can impact with what they've learned from other walks of life their businesses their jobs their experiences that they've been through can all help you become a better coach yeah then, then then transferable skills and i guess i think where i was leading to is if you are working with players every day then you, you'd like to think that there, there's going to be some improvement if you are a grassroots grassroots coach working with a, a team for one hour a week that you know that's that might be what I know there's 52 weeks in a year, but you don't deliver or you might do 30 sessions a year. And yet that would take someone like you a month. So, to, to you know, you yeah, can see the yeah. comparison between the two. Hours, so yeah. to say that I have had a, oh, I've had my uh, UA for B or, or level two for, for two years. That doesn't really mean it. It's the, it's the number of hours that you've been on the grass or observing other people or being mentored or reading books or coming onto fantastic platforms like my mentor and um and uh, well, and, well. and just yeah yeah absolutely so yeah. um i think that's where i was because uh, yeah. I, I started the question with them um, what are some of the you know some of the the things that great about you about coaches that so i'll flip it on its head those coaches that that are good that, that you look up to or, or even the younger ones that are potentially coming through what what things, I know you mentioned personality, what other things do they have in common that, that makes them stand out from, from the rest? I think drive, I think certainly, because that's, that's probably what we've just discussed there, isn't it? From different yeah. people with different motivations. And 
And having drive doesn't necessarily mean that if you work with an under nines grassroots team that you want to be an under 18s coach at Man United it, it, it's about trying to be very good for those group of kids because you work with them once a week like you just touched upon but if you're one if you're good at something and you want to be good at something it's that drive in order to try to keep things fresh or to keep players motivated and, and to deliver that I think it's about being creative I think that's the real thing that that um, I look for and I try to encourage so often with 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 new coaches is about trying things and about expressing things and about getting things wrong, you know, for us and for the kids and for the players that you're working with. But I think that's something that I see from, I touched upon Chris Ramsey and Alex, so I'll stay on that theme with them, that Chris was never afraid to try something. He was never afraid for you to try something. If, as long as it fitted within what we were delivering as a club and what the club, club philosophy um, was focused upon, as long as it had those themes in it, yeah, go and go and try something. Go and be, you know, go and be creative with what you're trying to do. Um, I know that when I, I spent some time up at Liverpool um, over a, about a year ago with, with Alex, and, and a lot of what he was working on with the players, but with his coaches, was about being carefree and trying to trying to try new things. So I think those things are really, really important behind those those people is that drive to get better that drive to make your players better and to put your players at the forefront of everything you do not make it about you not make it about where you're trying to get to because if you do that and you aspire to make people better and, 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 and aim for the stars with your players there's a very good chance that you edge a little bit closer of getting there yourself um mm -hmm. So like I say that, so like, you know, sort of, I suppose to, to cap them off, it'd be personality, it'd be drive, it about being creative and, and that desire to, to make you and your players better. Yeah. I've got a few more questions. Um, and we've got a couple that have come in from our, our members as well. Um, one in particular was um, around your leadership, obviously having been at the number one position at a club, um, what what is your leadership? If you had to describe it, what is your leadership style? I think that was something I found the hardest. I think I found it all, all one of the hardest elements to do it is, is when you're in that that seat, you're always looked upon for some sort of leadership. If things are going great, you've got to keep steering the ship in that direction and everybody just expects it to keep going great. And even though you're when things are going well it's still very tough to stay on it all the time because you, you desperately want it to keep carrying on and, and, and heading in the right direction. So I think it's about trying to, um, like I say, from that perspective, and then also the other end of it is when things are not going well as a team, but then also at the same time for the players that are not in the team, you've then got to lead them in a different direction or a, or a direction towards getting them as part of the group or back on side or motivated to do certain things. So I think it was certainly something that I found really, really difficult. Um, when, when I've been at my best on that front, from a leadership perspective, I would say that um, from, for me, it was about trying to really inspire people in my sessions um, because I'm a coach and I, and I view myself as a coach, even when I was a manager that I wanted to be out there and on the pitch because that was the time where I really felt that I could lead people and inspire people and take them in the direction that, that I wanted them to go in. Um, I, I would say that in terms of putting a label on the style, I would like to think that I'm quite personal, a personable in terms of the way that I try to build relationships. I wanted to, going back to that bit about the honesty and, and communicating, but I wanted to try to communicate with my players as much as possible whether that was the good the bad or the ugly in terms of telling them like why they weren't in the team telling them what they needed to do to get back into the team being able to help them but that was one part of it that I found really difficult is that as the assistant I knew that I could grab a player right you're not in the team let's go out and do more of this this is what the manager wants to see from you let's go and work on your crossing let's go and work on your heading your clearances whatever it might be Whereas when I was the number one, when I was the manager, one time didn't allow me to do that. And two, sometimes you needed to withdraw yourself from that situation rather than being the one that drives people out there all the time because 
ultimately you're the one that don't pick them at the weekend and, and you're the one causing that upset and frustration. Um, but I would say that, like I say, being, trying to be a strong communicator and, and, and trying to get on a personal level with everybody is something that I think is, is me. So therefore, it would be something that, 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 that I would try to take into my, my leadership or management, if you like. Um, what's your preference, number one or number two? I mean that a number one. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads of different ways you could take that. <laughs> a manager or an assistant manager, yeah. <laughs> I think I've been at my happiest as a, in, terms of, in terms of work as, as the number two. Um, I think what helps that is, again, my most success um, out on the training pitch, out, on, out in terms of developing players and selling players, getting players into the first team winning games of football um, I think that was when I was definitely at my best because I worked with a leader just mentioned about leadership there but I worked with a man that was um, his biggest strength was his leadership qualities he would be if he was still here now to the day to be able to communicate what we're talking about now he would be very much talking about the relationships he builds with his players the personality that he has the strength that he shows in the good and the bad and hard decisions that you have to make and that took all that pressure away from me and I could go out and I could coach every day and really talk about the football. I could work with the, the analyst. I had the time to you know, really build good relationships with the sports scientists. So there was a real structure to the way that we work. We had that when, when I was the number one. But the time in the day just makes it really, really difficult. And the pressure of the job and the demand of the job makes it very, very difficult to, 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 to be out there and, and, and deliver in, in the same sort of way touched upon it just now you, you there has to be times when you withdraw yourself and you know and, and, and hand the sessions over or, or certain elements of the week over to other people and that was something I found really really difficult so I think I've been at my best when I've done when I've done the, the number two's job when I've done the number one um, it would certainly make me a hell of a lot better after after doing it I think that's probably the hardest bit isn't it as a as you two are coaches uh, predominantly and as you can tell the passion comes through from both of you to delegate uh, the responsibility of a bit of a session or, or the session probably one of the hardest bits because that, that's what you're judged on that's where you get your team you know it's quite a lot of trust in, in the person you're giving it to but also quite a, a feeling to hand that over I, I presume given yeah. your experiences I think um, I think you're exactly right that was again one of the things not just from me from a selfish perspective but when I worked for for Justin Edinburgh he would allow everybody the autonomy to do it one because analysis wasn't his thing sports science wasn't his thing um, coaching wasn't his thing and, and I'm, it, it wasn't football was of course but his relationships with his players and the people and the staff was something that was a real bond. So the players knew that they had the freedom to go and play in a certain way, but you know that, that had to fit in with what he wanted. But they had the freedom to go and express themselves. And the same with, with, with the staff. And I think, I don't know what, what Jamie thinks about this, but from a personal point of view, I wanted to be involved in everything. I wanted to be in the analysis meetings. I wanted to do the one-to-one -one work. I wanted to sit with the sports scientists and the physio and... I wanted to go coaching. I didn't want to stand back and let somebody else do it. I think the other side of it as well is that that pressure of winning and losing, you want to make sure that when they cross the white line at the weekend, that you've done every single thing possible to enable them to be capable of doing that. And I'd always been involved in so much of it that when I became the manager, I found it very, very difficult to stand back or to hand it over, to let go. Um, I wanted people, I wanted to delegate, but I weren't quite sure exactly how to do it to begin with, if I'm honest. No, I, I could not agree more. Um, and, that, and then again, I think we refer back to it, but it's probably from that lack of playing background thing that I mentioned right at the beginning. That ain't no different for anyone that works in a, you know, manages people in a finance office or, you know, whatever people do for a living that, that are listening in on this, it's it, that's no different to managing any group of people or any business at, at, at after you know at a certain level. No, um, I know you touched on sports science there and the analyst in particular. I mean, how 
what's your your take on it and and also the importance of it um for when you as coach and manager but also in in, in the game in general i think it's massive on both levels sports science i think um incredibly that um it can influence and help and impact your coaching so much in terms of the type of sessions that you do and way in which you um you know you're obviously trying to develop and enhance your players on a physical level um as well as you know technically and tactically etc <clears throat> but um I found that it really enhanced. The more I embraced sports science, the more I look and think and read about, um, you know, structuring a week when I'm talking about working with full-time players, how, how it could influence the type of sessions that, that I wanted to do. And then, you know, the, the, the timings in which I run my sessions for, when we have our breaks in the sessions, the, the demand of, of, um, of, of players in a certain element of a, of a game that, that I found really fascinating in terms of evolving my coaching even more, um, certainly in the last three or four years. Um, and then from an analysis point of view, I, 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 I would, I, I swear by every, every ounce of analysis. I'm not massive on data um, because I think that you can manipulate data. <clears throat> I think you can use data for your advantage or your disadvantage, whether you want to, build something up or shoot something down so I'm not huge on that but I think um, watching games back, watching sessions back, encouraging players to educate themselves on how to do that was something that I'm really passionate about because I think the more that, that the ownership and responsibility can come from the players um, the better those meetings, those consultations, those discussions are going to be I think the minute that you're trying to, 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 to drag a player into something and, and, and force something onto someone, um, the harder that's going to be to, to, to gain a motivation out of, out of doing something like that. So uh, I'm incredibly passionate about both. And I would say that, that, that both elements of, of both analysis and sports science have really impacted my coaching over the last three years. Yeah, cool. Obviously, I'm a big advocate of sports science, so I'm glad you said that. <laughs> um, the other one was um, we 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 touched on it a little bit earlier around the um, the grassroots dad coach or mum coach, um, and it was if they they do a session, and I'm sure we've all seen the typical session that can go on. Um, a six side game pretty much would be uh, the backbone of that. How would you? What's a good, I guess, if you had an hour, what's a good hour spent at that level trying to, to improve people? How, how would you go about that? And, and equally to both of you, but what's your recommendation for a dad coach who hasn't really got the time to plan and prepare? What can they do to make that hour as impactful as they can? I think we've, um, I mean, first of all, it's important to understand that there's nothing wrong with kids playing a game. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I think the, that's what they want to do. After all, if we're talking about motivating people and wanting them to come back and wanting to wanting them to enjoy what they do, there'd be a high percentage of kids that would want to turn up every week and do an hour's worth of six aside. So, and I don't think there's a great deal wrong with that. I think perhaps within that hour, if that was your motivation for for a particular week, it maybe be about trying to be a bit creative of looking for certain things from individuals, um, maybe putting constraints on <clears throat> on players, on particular players, on the strong, on the weaker, whatever it might be, in order to in order to, to make those games that little bit more competitive, um, to create challenges for different people, like I say, for the good or the bad, that people come out of that with with a success rather than being the stood in the corner waiting for something to happen or being the one that's dominant with with the ball for that whole hour. It's about breaking the game up as much as you possibly can to give them different levels of motivation within that. I mean, from an idealistic session for me, I'm hugely passionate about individual player development, but one, developing 1v1 specialists. And when I say 1v1 big specialists, I don't mean create Lionel Messi to get it and dribble and try to beat everyone. I mean, create players who are comfortable with the ball 1v1, whether that's to be 
someone that plays in front of people and passes the ball, whether that be to someone that, that can dribble or whether that be a defender that can carry the ball into the middle of the pitch. That might be to develop a player 1v1 defensively, offensively. So I think there's loads of different angles to that 1v1 specialism. But for me, in order to achieve that, I would like to see that the first 15, 20 minutes is all catered for with a ball. I think that the boys, girls have to have the ball at their feet. They have to be comfortable to be able to move with a ball, to manipulate the ball, of course, um, to understand about moving in tight spaces, big spaces, because I think that's something that we miss out on now. I think over the last number of years, fantastic development of, of playing on, on 3G surfaces, but so much of it's done in tight areas. So it's about trying to get players to understand what they do in a tight area and how to master the techniques, but then also how they do that in bigger areas as well. Um, another part of, of, of that player development at a younger age certainly is about being able to, when we say about manipulate the ball, but keeping the ball up, keep working on both feet. I think that's, again, another element of that first 15, 20 minutes that you can do with a player that um, is going to enable them to be comfortable, more comfortable with the ball and, and again, aware of the spaces that are around them. And again, when I talk about the 1v1s, I, I think another part of a session that I would do a hell of a lot, and I, and I do with a, an under-10s team that I work with on a regular basis, and even, even younger than that, is about getting players to work against an opponent, so they're using their bodies, they're using their arms to protect the ball. And it, again, it doesn't matter if you're you know, super, super top under-10 player or you're the player that's catching up in the group. It's about trying to make people confident and comfortable and happy to have the ball rather than just kicking it away and you know, only touching it once every 15, 20 minutes in a game, I think it's it's really important to be able to manipulate that. So for me, if you were breaking it down into maybe three parts, I would certainly have a ball each at the beginning where they're working on their skills and their techniques and touching the ball and their spatial awareness. The second half of that or the second third of that would be to have players working against each other, whether that's facing someone in a 1v1, back to players, using their arms to protect the ball, little mini games where they're you know, playing 1v1s up against each other in, in, in small little areas and giving them the opportunity to, to dribble. And then their, um, their focus is on the game at the end. And I think it's about, again, getting those uh, elements of the small-sided games where it's going to create competition, it's going to create excitement, it's going to create energy. And I think all of those first parts of the session would feed into that, that latter part of it where where they're excited and energised about having the ball for an hour. Um, I'll add some, some of that. Uh, I'd be exactly the same. I just, I, um, I pose the question sometimes on courses and say that a lot, of, a lot of grassroots coaches might not have the time to plan for a session. So, like, if you just play the game for an hour, the kids are going to get something from that. Um, would you play? Would you play World Cup singles or World Cup doubles for an hour? And I pose that question. And there's lots of. Mm, I'm not sure, but bearing in mind, as kids, we'd play it for five hours. Never mind. Never mind one hour. So, and and I guess there's an element of what what does coaching look like? Actually, just providing opportunities for them to play. And kids are sometimes, sometimes parents, uh, coaches couldn't can ruin a session. So what I mean by that, if there was an odd number and you're playing World Cup, World Cup doubles, who goes on their own? And probably normally the best player. And that, and and that's kids sorting out them sort of solutions. Um, how did I learn to volley? Well, I played headers and volleys down the park. No one, no one took me aside and a bag of balls and said, right, volley these. So I'd almost encourage an element of play within their sessions. So all that, the, the 1v1, um, that, that's World Cup singles for me. And yet, You're right. yeah, yeah, right. and, and, um, but you, you get, you know, uh, loads of touches of the ball, um, loads of options to attack, loads of opportunities to defend. Um, and just that, you know, if we want kids to fall in love with the game, and I guess the reason it's not done as much anymore 
in in structured training sessions i never we never done that when i was when i was a kid because i was always doing it down the park but if if there are less kids down the park now where do they get that informal play um from and i think by introducing it into your sessions um and i think one of the biggest thing that coaches worried about not doing that is because they of what parents perceived coaching to look like and actually you know that's um so look, i know it does all this i know it's great for attacking defending uh mastering your body mastering the ball but parents think that coaching is like i need to be continuously telling you information and um and telling you what i think is right and what's wrong and i think we just some support for coaches to say actually just putting on this practice and just going st- standing back and going crack on have a good time kids yeah uh, do you know what as well i mean i, I talked about chris ramsey earlier and that was like that in, a, in our academy sessions that it wasn't about having a straight line of blue cones next to a straight line of white cones <laughs> and a kid in a white bib playing against a kid in a yellow bib i can't tell you the last time i used a set of bibs <laughs> because it's not about necessarily having that real total structure now i'm lucky that over the year, last few years the parents of the kids that I work with, they, they turn up and they know that my session's going to look like a free-for-all. And I think that's the other part of what you're saying there. There's nothing wrong with going, right, well, boys, there's two cones. Go and have a 1v1 in a goal. Yeah, how do we do that? I don't know. You work it out. And and, and, and if it looks like it's unorganised or they need some help, then go and help them. But I think that's the real important thing is that coaching don't have to look for them and proper. It don't, yeah. you know, it, people will want you to, and I'm sure along the way you might lose one or two people if they don't you know if they're, if they're craving that structure but in order to give kids a good time and in order to make people better or enjoy your environment a lot lot more it don't have to look so so fantastic was, like it does in all these videos yeah i always thought that. i thought the more experienced you are the less equipment that you need is something that, that that i always thought you could tell a new coach just by how many cones that they had laid down <laughs> um but they, you know, they're, they're learning their, they're learning the way, which we all did. Yeah. Um, we're going to go into a quick fire round of, of questions, Ross. Uh, pressure. We, yeah, no pressure. Uh, we've got a few. There's a few that are obviously a bit more uh, jovial um, rather than just always co- coaching centric. But uh, we will start. I've got about seven questions, I think. Um, <laughs> so. How would players describe you in three words? Um, energetic, fun, and passionate. What has been your best coaching experience? That, that, that being the ones that were in the team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Second question: What would the people that weren't in the team? How would they describe sure, you? Yeah. You might have to beep out the other ones for the ones that got dropped. <laughs> Sorry, mate. No, no, no. And, and what would be, uh, so second question, what would be or what has been your best coaching experience to date? This is really difficult. Um, I would have to say winning the league. I would have to say winning the National League at Leighton Orient because um, the club had been relegated from league football for the first time in its history I think a two year turnaround period of relegation to promotion was um, at that level quite a a big achievement for us, it was a club where I've been a season ticket holder and coached most of my life Um, so to to win a league and gain that success and pitch invasion at the end we got to Wembley the same season so a huge amount of memories, although that would be behind a lot of different uh, sorry on a, on a in a different format um there was moments within time that i was manager where we won games that were that, you know that were, that were fantastic and there's been some moments with regards to working with individual players that have been sold or moved on or you see some outstanding piece of skill from a young four or five year old that you know are just you know just as motivating and, and, and satisfying but i think if there had to be one outstanding highlight it would have to be that uh, your favourite book? Um, Clive Woodward, his autobiography. I actually didn't remember the Winning, is it that one? Winning? It is, yes. Yeah. I just think that 
he was way way before his time in terms of just how creative he tried to be and there were so many things that he did in his coaching and management that would have been frowned upon you know the, the, you know we talk about Sam Allardyce in football about his, his sports science and analysis and Clive Woodford was massive on that with regards to how he um he did that with England the, the, the things where he introduced music to training sessions just quirky unique things that now we would look back on and a lot of people will think well yeah that gets done all the time but at the time there were there were certain elements to that book where um where he really started from the bottom recreated something brought so many different new ideas and ideas and philosophies into what he tried to try to do and then to win the world cup ain't a bad way to end it is it really right <laughs> Um, I'd be really intrigued with Clive Woodward as well, just to add on to that. I'd be really intrigued if he were to have his time in football now, rather than when he did. You know, he went into Southampton and he was almost sort of laughed out the door a little bit. Um, mm. I'd love to know whether or not someone like that, how well accepted they would be now, because I think the ideas and attitudes towards him would be completely different. Mm-hmm. Get him next week, next time for you, Ross. That's your yep. first, that my challenge. <laughs> first person. Um, uh, if you could invite anyone around for dinner, who would be, uh, I guess, let's say two people you invite around for dinner and why? Football or non-football? Completely whatever you want to do. Right, anyone. One, do one football and one non. Pep, no, your missus is probably I listening. Can't, can't. You don't yeah, have oh, to no, obviously that. my missus, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, you cheeky cook. <laughs> As if I'll do, they'd be poisoned. Um, well, I, I'd have to invite Pep. I'd have to. Uh, I can't I can't not have anybody else that's involved in football to come. And I think if it was non-football, this is going to be really, really uh, out there. But I'd invite Amy Winehouse. Oh, that is out there. Uh, tell you what, she could create a party as well, couldn't she? <laughs> she could <laughs> And then off the flip of that, uh, obviously, barring if the missus was out, so what would you cook? Mexican. Oh, nice. Mexican would be my uh, yeah my food of choice. And we... uh, but if my missus was out, I'd have to order it in, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got two final ones. One is, is, is a bit more on the human side and the other is uh, around coaching. So I'll start with the, the coaching one. If you had to name one quality in a coach to make them effective or good, what is the one quality or characteristic that makes a good coach? I think the ability to make people enjoy what you do or what they do. You can take that one of two ways, but to be able to make people enjoy what you're delivering or be able to create an environment where they could enjoy it. Okay. And then the final question, given uh, the name of, of this series, what is your favourite coffee? Ooh. Black Americano runs it very close, but I think if I had a choice to have one, it would be a latte. As there you well know, James. I did know that one. You nearly <laughs> chucked me with the Americano. Yeah, I threw one in there. <laughs> make it too easy. Okay, brilliant. Well, uh, that that that's it for the conversation. Um, I just before we finish, just say a huge, huge thank you uh, to Ross for giving up his time, uh, and to Jamie for helping and supporting uh, this webinar. Uh, it's a straight podcast. Um, so yeah, I just a huge, huge thank you to, uh, for giving up your time, um, and really, really enjoyed that conversation. Thanks, Ross. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really good. <laughs>